Content marketers focused in deeply technical industries have unique challenges from breaking down the complex into the consumable, managing subject matter expert writing anxiety, and striking the right ex educational balance, and then, oh yeah, making it all interesting. So today I have Peter Matthews, Senior Technical Marketing Manager at Knowles Precision Devices. And listen, he is a skilled architect of content for design engineers. Through his industry experience mixed with a lot of trial and error, Peter has perfected a high-performing, predictable content marketing strategy. On today's episode, he'll be giving us the secrets behind his success. It's a very practical episode with lots of tips, so you'll want to listen in. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each podcast episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in marketing to technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues and industry friends of mine who will stop by to tell you their stories along the way. My goal is that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, True Marketing. True is a content marketing agency based in beautiful Austin, Texas, and serves companies focused in technical industries. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Well, today I'm joined by Peter Matthews, who's the Senior Technical Marketing Manager at Knowles Precision Devices. Hello, Peter, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. Hi, Wendy. Nice to be here. Tell me a bit about your career journey and what led you to Knowles. Okay. Well, um, so the overall, I guess the overall theme has been a, a mixture of working with technology and, and then talking to people about it. Um, obviously, the, the, the ratios of the two ingredients uh, change over time. Um, my formal education was in physics, uh, and it turns out that that works really well as sort of a, a, a good toolkit. Um, it helps me grasp at least the basics of most of the technologies I've worked with, so that's sort of nice to have uh, in the back pocket. and. I've always also had a strong parallel interest in communicating, so writing and talking and, and, and listening. So that led naturally to a career in technical sales and marketing. Um, and I've been doing that with different titles with words like sales and marketing and <laughs> product, you know, variations on a theme for, for a little over 20 years. Um, and I was with a, a, actually a different part of Knowles working on a, a, a different technology when the opportunity to do what I'm doing now came up. Okay. And, you know, sometimes salespeople are really excited about marketing. So tell me about that. Were you all, did you always have a marketing component of your job when you were in sales or did you um, see things that could be done better that made you want to, you know, go to the dark side, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've always liked talking shop. Um, you know, when, when you're in, when you're selling in a, in a, in a technical discipline, often your customers are engineers, people that are going to buy your your widget, your technology. And often the best conversations are the ones where you, you get that person very comfortable talking about what they do and talking about the challenges that they face. Because oftentimes, you know, th that will lead to, well, gee, I had a wish, a, I wish I had a widget that did this, right? And then you can sort of pounce and say, well, I, I have one. Um, and so that, that's probably how I actually made the transition from more salesy to, to more marketing is that I got more and more interested in the, in the conversation mm -hmm. and uh, maybe less dedicated to the actual sale. <laughs> that's fair enough. 
And then of course your knowledge of that customer and being able to put yourself in their shoes made you a wonderful content developer. So we'll be talking more about that. Um, okay. Well, before we do, so tell me a little bit about Knowles and Knowles Precision Devices. Sure. So, um, so Knowles Corporation uh, is a company headquartered in, in Itasca, Illinois, and there's really two large chunks of the company. There's what I would call the audio business. Um, so that has to do with uh, microphones and speakers in electronic devices, things like, um, I don't know, smart home devices, things like that, cell phones. Um, I think the original Mr. Knowles um, invented some uh, hearing aid technology, some speaker technology. And, you know, if, if you look on the main Knowles website, I think, yeah, when we came up on the anniversary of the, uh, the Apollo uh, program, you know, we had this little thing saying, um, Neil Armstrong actually spoke his words through a Knowles microphone. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so, so, so there's, that, there's that part of the company. And then there's the piece that I work for, which, which we call Knowles Precision Devices. Um, and we're mostly, uh, I would say, capacitors, which is a type of electronic component, and then microwave components, which is a class of electronic components. Mm -hmm. and so those are the big chunks. And then I work for precision devices chunks. And we've got two main types of technology, like, like I said, capacitors and, and microwave technology. So it sounds to me, based on that technology, that design engineers are an important focus for your marketing and sales efforts. It, absolutely. So the, these are the, the um, I'd say, the main class of uh, a persona, if you like, um, that we're writing content for is, is somebody that's building something, somebody that's designing something, and they've got maybe a, <laughs> a, a product shaped hole in in their what they're building and you can come <laughs> along and talk about how you can help them fill that gap yeah so we've already established that you're, you're pretty in pretty uh focused in knowing your persona your target persona and so with that in mind how do you make sure you reach them at the right time with the right message what are some of the strategy pieces that you put into place to make sure that you're on the right track Right. So in terms of timing, that, that's a good question. We, we have a, an overall content calendar for the year. And, you know, when you step back and look at the calendar, you can populate it with some, let's call them natural features like trade shows and product launch dates. And so we work closely with the product teams in the, in the company to understand what technologies are going to be talked about and when, and that gives us, um, you know, at a top level, some themes or to topics to put in the calendar, you know, in, mm -hmm. in July, we're going to be discussing such and such. Um, often that approach yields some very specific content needs. You know, I, I, the product team will say, I need to promote product A for application B in the lead up to the trade show C. And that's great. You've already, you, you, you know, roughly what you're going to be talking about and when, um, and then, you know, the process of generating content is filling in the gaps between those things. Um, I think another part of planning when you, when you step back and look at it is, is maybe building to a message. So if, if the product team is going to be launching something later in the year, let's say, and the conversation is actually quite complicated, you know, it's, it's, uh, a technology that addresses a, a fairly complicated challenge and, and, it, and it's a fairly complicated subject. What you can do is you can plant some content seeds that speak, um, speak to that topic that you're going to be addressing in, in the future. And, and that can actually help, you know, you can plan a nice content cluster around the thing that you're going to be talking about so that when you do actually launch the product or do the webinar or you know announce a breakthrough you've it, it it's that sort of natural transition in this conversation you're having with the market so that's another thing you can do from a planning perspective is 
just think about the timing of, of when you want to say something. Um, so we do that both those kinds of planning, right? So you've got the, 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 the trade shows, the product launches, and then this kind of idea of storyboarding, if you like, building up the message towards the big, the big unveil. Um, but there are also things that just come up, um, like invited articles or interviews and, and opportunities to be, you know, part of a podcast and things like that. Um, and so you mix those in as well. So there, there is a, there's a fair amount of planning that goes into it. Um, but there's also a percentage of it that is TBD. Cause you, you have this opportunistic layer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and you allow for that, right? Cause sure. you, you've got to look at resources and bandwidth and say, what if such and such a magazine asks us, well, okay, that's fine. Um, and, and you develop that sense over time. Yeah. I, I like what, when you discussed, you know, the topic clustering and, and getting ahead of that product launch or uh, whether it's telling that complex story or just developing your expertise, you know, in advance, I think that's an excellent tactic and it works very well with search, you know, having that relational content that's all linked together. So I think yep. that's an important strategy and it does take quite a bit of planning. Um, yes, we've, um, it, Partly that sort of, there is that deliberate con component, right? When, when, you, when you're working on content marketing, you're aware of um, topic clusters and um, linking um, and, and how that performs in search. But there's, there's also just a very human component, which is that you can only push so much detail through the content team at a given time. Um, so if you've got a big subject that requires a lot of explanation, mm -hmm. now one thing to consider when you're looking at your calendar is can you smear it out over time? And then it's bite-sized for the people consuming your content, it's bite-sized for your, 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 your SMEs and your writers. Very good point. So, so tell me, so back to um, the timing around industry trade shows. So right now, obviously, when we're recording this, those trade shows aren't happening or, or perhaps they're moving online. So just as a quick sidebar, what's happened to your marketing plan for the remainder of 2020? Um, so a chunk of the shows have just been outright canceled. Um, and that, that, that's okay because a lot of the content plan can then just be repurposed mm -hmm. um and that we've seen a percent not everybody's doing this and and i think people are learning by doing um several folks have decided they're going to have <laughs> their billing as virtual trade shows um i'm not quite sure how that will go but it's interesting so you know for example a, a piece of content we would have been planning to to deliver next month actually would have been a series of technical talks given by our engineers and well the show's not actually going to happen in person so they won't get up on the stage but we've got the content we, we've got the talks ready to go so we'll record them perfect um, and and it, so you adapt um and that is the nice thing about building content is that it is very adaptable you, you mm -hmm. can reshape it and repurpose it yeah well, let's talk about your development of individual content pieces. Right. How do you approach? So we've already talked, you have some very technical, deeply technical subjects. So do you just identify the engineers within the company that are subject matter experts and ask them to write on a topic? Do you pair them with a writer or are you using a different approach? Yeah. So that, <laughs> that's, that's another good question. Um, I think the dream is always that you can find a, a subject matter expert who can write well and has the time to write. Um, but that's not usually an option. Yeah, is that because, the dream or the fantasy? <laughs> I would say that's, yeah, perhaps the fantasy. Um, and it's, it's, right, it's normal and natural. It's, it's, there are different skill sets required. And the folks that make really, really good SMEs tend also to be very, <laughs> in demand technical people, right? There's, there's all sorts of other parts, all sorts of stakeholders, all sorts of other parts of the company that want a piece of their time, including the most important stakeholder, which is the customer, 
right? So we nearly always pair an SME with a writer. Um, it, it, we found it helps if, if the writer gets at least some of the basics, um, right? So they know what some of these widgets are. Uh, they don't have to know the details, but they need to have a rough idea of what they are. The acronyms, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah some of the acronym soup and yes. um, some of the, you know, units of measure and things like that. Um, and when, you know, th this number is bigger than this number, that's a good thing. And this number is bigger than this thing. And that's <laughs> actually a bad thing. thing. Yeah. Right. This, this is a directional, one. right. And, and we've been very lucky um, to have access to, to a team of writers um, who write about technology, right? So they, they come to the task with a, a sort of, let's call it nuts and bolts understanding of, okay, these are things and I'm used to writing about these things. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise you find even when you pair an SME with a writer, that the SME ends up explaining so much of it mm. that they've effectively written the article and then you haven't saved anybody any time. Right. That very frustrating situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so do you have any advice for this collaboration? Have you, I guess that's an example of how it doesn't work, right. but for those listening that are trying to foster this collaboration, are you seeing some best practices you can share? Yeah. So, I mean, one suggestion I would make, um, is building some sort of a structure around who, who does what, um, and, and, you know, once you've built that structure, you can, you can explain it to people. We found that en engineers tend to respond well to systems, to, to processes and procedures. And so what we don't do is just lock the SME and the writer in a room and say, don't come out <laughs> until, you know, until the white paper's done. Um, and so the way we do that, it, it's, it's fairly, um, it's not tremendously exciting, but we, we make a content specification, right? Our, uh, the products, the things we sell to our customers have specifications. So we approach the content from the same thing and at uh, the same point of view. So we have a spec, which is a really a documented checklist that we go through internally with the SMEs and that helps them to highlight what are some of the key themes? What are some of the key facts? Um, you know, some of the SMEs are fairly nervous about writing and we found that if you can break it down into, you know, tell me some of the stats, tell me some of the key things, um, concentrate on bullet points, concentrate on short, plain English, almost conversational sentences as you're, as you're building the spec document. Mm -hmm. That takes away some of the, oh, it's, it's writing anxiety, and they get to just settle down and talk shop, and that's what you want. You want them talking about, this thing that they're good at and this thing that they're passionate about. So you strip away some of the um, mystique yes. <laughs> around writing content and, and you treat it like it's a product, just like anything else that they work on. Great. Um, the other ingredient in that is that during that process of building that spec, uh, a member of the marketing team is, is present to chair or even referee that conversation. <laughs> um, you know, the, the person from marketing knows enough about the technology to, to prompt the SME and maybe we know there's something interesting we're up to, but we want them to say it in their words. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, being from marketing, they know enough about, well, marketing to, to, to feed the writer a bit as well say okay well he said something really interesting here so we could expand it um and so the team over time the team members get used to the process and that pattern seems to be working very well for us so we have a, a team of three personas if you like you have the sme the writer and then someone in the middle who knows enough about both disciplines to be dangerous. I uh, really like this someone in the middle because I, I'm sitting here thinking about how you have your, at the top level, right? Your company brand messaging, 
and then you have the product line and then you have this specific product or technology that you're writing about and of right. course you want some relationship between all of this right. and you know you want to be able to um, you know have that brand messaging in there and um, just kind of have some of the, the strong messages repeated throughout different types of content so that marketing person really does play a critical role in ensuring that consistency yeah and and the you know the the, the keeping it flexible so that that level of participation can grow or shrink yeah um, so some SMEs will attempt to restrict themselves to one word answers and some <laughs> will be, you know and it's so you, 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 flexibility i guess is is another yeah. important component but yes you're absolutely correct that person who can see the various pieces and and kind of help help connect the sme and the writer through those those different threads if you like yeah so i imagine when your when your sme is a technical engineer that's really excited about the product you get way deep into specs and then maybe your performance. And uh -huh. then when you have say a product manager as the SME, you get things that are perhaps too promotional. Oh, this is, you know, the, the best capacitor ever. <laughs> so, uh, so how do you, you know, what type of balance do you try to strike? And is that ever difficult with personalities within the company? So you, you certainly get a different, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head. You get different, you get different responses depending on the role that person does in the company because they there's certain sort of pieces of value they're drawing attention to i think when it comes to content if you, if you do it right it's pretty much all educational um and that could be education about the topic education about a potential challenge and then education about the opportunity your technology presents so realistically, behind the scenes, it's all promotional in intent. Um, but we we try and make everything educational in in uh, inverted commas content, right? Mm -hmm. So it's promotional intention, but it's the, the actual content of it is educational. So even if you've got a blog post and it's, hey, we made a new widget, please look at it, you can shape that and say, hey, we made a new widget and it has to do with this interesting topic slash challenge over here. Things that are educational or, or useful tend to be more interesting and fun to work on. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes through. So they're more interesting and fun to read. Um, you, you don't always have that option, right? Sometimes, sometimes you just, you know, you've got, you've gone from, version 1.1 to version 1.2 and you need to say it because you need to communicate it and there isn't really a lot but if you have that opportunity to make that link to to make a connection to something that is educational i, I strongly recommend that yeah um and and that's where that middle person comes in so you, you you mentioned earlier you've got the person in marketing who can see all of these different um angles that folks have and so the role of the person in the middle of the role of the marketing um, member of that content creation team is to take the specs that the engineer is talking about, take the features and benefits, right? The very producty, selling-y stuff that the, maybe the product manager is talking about. And mm -hmm. you don't hide anything, but you, 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 you recast it in a way that you know, hopefully is, is going to be interesting. Yeah, interesting, helpful. But at the end of the day, sometimes even the design engineer just needs the specs to know if it fits. Yeah. So there's there's yeah. a, a place for everything. <laughs> Abs absolutely, yeah. right? There is yeah. there is a, um, a a lot of our products come with um, uh, additional chunks of data mm -hmm. that are useful. Um, and you need it. If, you, if you're actually going to use this widget in your design, you would like to get some simulation data that shows you how it's going to perform in the circuit under such and such conditions. So that content is vital. If it's missing, you're not helping that person you're describing, Wendy. So yes, it is there, but maybe it's towards the back of the, 
back of the library, so to speak. Right. So uh, you, you first pique someone's interest, educate them, and then get them to the point where they want to read <laughs> that sort of, you know, lower funnel type of uh, right. And then, yes. Yeah. And then you could get the great big heavy reference book out and you can get it to <laughs> Right. Oh, let's hope it's not a physical book anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> Uh, well, let's, uh, okay, so, so let's switch focuses a bit. So we've talked about, this is a, this is a pretty time intensive process to create a quality piece of content. So you've gone through those steps. Um, repurposing, as we both know, is a great way to just get more life out of that effort to get more ROI. And you've already mentioned your example from earlier about how you had somebody going to present at a conference and had some content already planned about that, around that, and, and then turned it into a webinar. So let's talk about repurposing a bit. Do you, I know that you repurpose, I know this is on your mind, so do you start with a plan for reusing content in different ways before the piece is development, developed or afterwards? And just give us some examples that, that are inspiring of repurposing. Yeah, so I mean, in, in terms of so working backwards, in terms of examples, um, you know, an example might be a, a new white paper. And when we publish it initially, it's gated on our website. So somebody has to fill in a form to get it. And we're doing that to generate leads. Um, and so initially, when we, when we launched that, the repurposing might look like drawing on elements of the white paper. So short summary, uh, teasers of the content to create public domain blog posts. And then over time, um, and, and, and so we do sort of look at this on the calendar, is as we think about how long a, a white paper has been on the shelf, so to speak, and after it's been gated for a certain amount of time, you might place it in the public domain with a content distribution partner, which is another another person, another company's website that's interested in publishing your content and you feel like you've got the gated, you know, it's gated function is, yeah, it's pretty well done now and, and it played it's not used anymore. So you, you put it out. Um, <clears throat> another example might be an old, old ebook goodie um, in, in, in companies such as ours. There's nearly always an application note or a how-to that's been around for ages. But people still love it, and and you know when you when you talk to the salespeople and you talk to the applications engineers, they're always referring customers to this thing, even though it was written ages ago and it's got a different logo on it from when you used to be called something else. <laughs> and so, you know, a certain amount of of content of of, of um, repurposing or recycling is to dust that off mm -hmm. and and resurface it. And again, you can have a blog post that sort of points to it. I says, hey, you know, if you're ever wondering how to do this, this is a really helpful piece of content. Um, when it comes to when it comes to planning for that, right? So your question is, how do you, how do you plan for content reuse? Um, I think there's a there's a again there's a sort of calendar based approach where you can look at your talks and you can look at your events. And you can plan to repurpose that content. So the, the trade show we talked about and the guys were going to get up and give a talk. Well, we'd already marked on our calendar, you know, a month, two months after the talk, we're going to write a blog post about the talk. Right? So you, you can, you can fill in your calendar with a, a sort of reminder to, to recycle that event because you, you know, it's going to happen with, with other things though, you can't tell in advance necessarily how useful or popular something is going to be. Um, so some of it is ad hoc and you, and you watch and you say, wow, this, this white paper got a ton of downloads. What's going on? Um, and maybe you have to dig into the reason for its popularity and, and look at that, that content, but also the topic cluster it belongs in is something of, hmm, I can, I can recycle some of these messages because they clearly resonate with, with our intended audience. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. So, so to recap, it's a combination of taking long form into short form, 
right. to, to look at what's performing well and, and take derivatives of that. Um, dusting off evergreen content. I love that. It's amazing how well evergreen content can do when it's fundamentals, the how to. Um, so those are, yeah, those are all excellent examples. And then of course, being in tune with what's happening with the rest of marketing and how can that um, spin out content either as promotional or as content assets itself. Yeah. So great yeah. examples. Um, well, this, this may be a bit of overlap. Uh, this, this next question I have for you, but when you just look at your high, let's say your three highest performing pieces of content you've ever had, yeah. what, are, what are some traits they have in common? Um, <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm actually thinking about them right now. Um, and it's interesting because there were two quite different which is two examples I'm thinking of, and they're different form factors. So one is an application note, and one, and one is a, an ebook, which is a, a really a collection of blog posts. Um, but what I think they have in common is um, this mixture of, of generality and detail. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, is so for example, the ebook is is a collection of um fundamentals and how to's to do with one particular technology and so you could look at the title of the ebook and it's very general um it's almost as if the, the subject or the title is casting a very wide net but once once somebody downloads it and opens it there's something specific in there for them so it's it's a very hard balance um and I, I must confess i think it's hard to do on purpose i think sometimes you do it <laughs> you, there's some you, luck involved <laughs> yeah, there's some luck involved and you learn by doing <laughs> sure. um you know we found content that can be part of a conversation in the industry so we did a webinar recently that was very well attended and the, and the nature of the webinar was that we presented the way we approached it was we're not just going to show you how to use our widget in this system that you're building. We're going to talk about the system. We're going to tell you what we know about the whole thing. Um, we're being modest enough or honest enough to say, we don't sell these things. We don't sell these systems. We don't know how it all works. We have a small piece of it. But we're going to paint a picture for you and then we're going to give you the specifics um so i i hope i'm not butchering that it's it's <laughs> no you're not i, I it, it's a general understand. enough it's it's a general enough topic to be something that would be useful for the industry even if they were never going to buy anything from you right so if it's something that's in the industry press if it's mm -hmm. something people talk about even if they never touch the components that you make but then you 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 sort of use that as the wrapper for some very specific things about the widgets you make that right. i would say is the common thread for both the the ebook which was on capacitors and then the application notes and the webinars which had to do with 5g and that i'd say that's the common thread excellent examples so if, if our listeners wanted to go see those examples and some of your other material, where can they go? Um, so I would, I would say start with our website, um, which is knowlescapacitors.com. Um, and, we, and we have a blog there. So you can start with the short form and, and then dig deeper if you like. Um, I would also say keep an eye out for us in industry press so there's a magazine called microwave journal that's carried some of our stuff uh, microwaves and rf electronic design Th these are various you know over the years these print publications are trend I sh they're not really magazines anymore they're websites they are um, yeah <laughs> so you could go to their websites and google uh -huh. dolls and, and and you'll see some of the things that so for example we talked about repurposing and putting something out in the wild so you'll see some of the things that used to be gated on our website and now public domain on their website. Um, and I'm curious, was that a requirement that it only be in one place? 
Um, so it depends um, on the the content distribution partner that you're working with. Um, some of them will be very, very upfront and, and, and uh, let's say delineated in terms of we're going to publish this on our website. We don't want you hosting it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and then others are a bit more relaxed. So we've actually had white papers that have been gated on our website and gated on some other websites. Ah. And, and the people running those publications don't seem to mind, um, probably because they think they get more traffic than we do, which is probably true. Um, other people have us sign, you know, a sort of degree of exclusivity and, and that's fine. Right? Mm -hmm. If you're writing a contributed article for somebody and they're kind enough to publish it, um, it's okay. Sure. It, and when you repurpose, you just have to change it sufficiently that you're not <laughs> plagiarizing your own content. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it varies. Okay, great. Well, Peter, this has all been extremely helpful, particularly for our listeners that focus with these deeply technical audiences and are wanting to know just what are the best practices of putting together these pieces of content and making them produce. And, and you guys over at Knowles, you have it down. So I really appreciate you being here today. And um, I guess as a final question, do you have any just parting words of advice for our listeners? Um, I, I would say keep it interesting. Um, if, it's, if it's fun and interesting to talk about internally, um, then it's probably going to be fun and interesting to read. All right. I like it. Keep it interesting, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Wendy. Visit contentmarketingengineer.com for notes and resources from today's episode. While there, you can subscribe to my blog, which will keep you up to date on new episodes and other resources for building trust and growing your business with technical content. Thanks and have a great